Hi investigators, welcome to the AirLap monthly meeting for members of the Academy of Investigation Risk and Loss Adjusting Professionals. Today we have our CPD points presentation for our members on general insurance. So effectively, members will be watching this presentation, answering the question at the end, sending their answers to me, and I will then, once I have those answers, be um, awarding the three CPD points for completing the general insurance investigation component. So here we go, straight into it with Pat Flynn and general insurance. Run you through, mate, a scenario that actually happened involving general insurance on the Gold Coast back in, I think it was 2019. So I'll show you the headline first. For those of you that are watching this live or watching the replay, Pat has never seen this before. He doesn't know what it's about. It's a complete surprise to him, just like every investigation we get. You don't know what you're going to get. It's a general insurance investigation, and nobody I know will be more up for this than Pat. So let's have a look at the scenario we're about to go through. So Cassandra has been left suicidal, and her business reputation has been shattered after she was charged with attempted fraud. The ordeal began in March 29th to April 5th, 2018, when Cassandra used an Airbnb to rent out her apartment while she was on her honeymoon in Italy. So she's contacted Airbnb, she's been away and she's rented her apartment. Before leaving, she locked up her expensive items in cabinets in an effort to protect them. The goods that went missing after the locks were broken included designer bags, a silver banana, designer shoes, and a Swarovski jewellery of some sort. Police were called and Miss House lodged an insurance claim with the um, online home rental company. That's Airbnb. After the company refused to pay up, Miss House turned up, um, sorry, returned to the Southport District Court in June last year and lodged a civil claim against Airbnb. Police then charged Miss House with fraud in November in 2019. I was in shock over it, she said. You have to go to the authorities. This is what they are there to protect us. So Pat, what we've got, a lady's gone on a honeymoon. She's rented her apartment out. She's Claim she's had things stolen. The Airbnb have knocked back the claim and the police have charged her with fraud. What's your initial take on this scenario? I, I don't know much about Airbnb, but I suppose the first thing that I look at every time when it comes to when a claim's made is the actual policy. Now, is she claiming under her home policy that she's taken out herself for the property with an underwriter, Suncorp, NRMA or whatever? Or is she relying on the insurance policy that's provided by Airbnb? If they have one, I don't know. So I suppose that's the first thing I would look at. The fact that she's been charged with fraud or attempted fraud suggests that she's put the claim in for the items that have been stolen, but they haven't actually been stolen. She's just putting in a false claim. So, yeah, they're the first few things that I would look at immediately. So what we don't know, as you pointed out, we all live in a house and we can all get contents insurance. Even if you don't yep. own the house, you can get contents insurance. And if you have contents insurance, you must tell if it says in the product disclosure statement, the insurance company, that you're going away on a honeymoon or on four weeks holiday or whatever you're going away for, and you are renting your property out. Now, that would yeah. be the number one thing if it was your home and con. Now, we don't know she had that, and I'm assuming she didn't have it because she's claimed against Airbnb. Now, Airbnb have come back, they've denied the claim outright. 
they've rented the property out to somebody <laughs> as she asked them to do and she claims these things are gone missing and I mean, she's an influencer she's got speaking engagements and stuff like that she's now been charged by fraud and i must add i really must add here those fraud charges were dropped it never went never proceeded she she was it was never pursued the police just dropped it it, it never went ahead but this is a typical example of the complexity of general insurance We've got a lot of twists and turns if you were to investigate this one pat how would you go about it? okay there's three aspects to um when you look at a general insurance claim the first one is like what policy or what insurance has been taken out by the insured now as you mentioned correctly the first thing you look at is the product disclosure statement you actually have a look at what the product is whether it's home and contents just contents or whatever it is and in the product disclosure statement there's two aspects of that that you it doesn't matter which insurance company you're going to work for or on behalf of there's two aspects of a product disclosure statement that you've got to be really familiar with one is the exemptions so things that are exempt from the policy and they will be things from such as renting your house out undertaking a business from home minimum security there's a whole range of things that are exclusions for the policy now extending on that you have limitations so sometimes you'll have things that are covered but up to a certain value i suppose stepping aside from a house policy if you look at motor vehicle policy generally the policy will only cover up to 500 dollars worth of contents say tools or clothing or something like that was in the car that was stolen so go back to the house it may be that electronic items or valuables such as jewelries there may be limitations set on those and that's where as an insured you'll often see a policy taken out and then you'll see add-ons to the policy that specifically deal with a fur coat a valuable ring a necklace a piece of um, artwork or whatever so you might find that there'll be the product disclosure statement for the policy and then a separate item put on there for something that's outside the general coverage of the policy and it may be something that's valuable or whatever so your first aspect is your product disclosure statement the second thing you need to do when you deal with the insured is actually if you can try and get a copy of their policy because the policy itself may vary from what the actual product disclosure statement is because it may have terms and conditions on there that have been added or qualified or quantified in regards to how the policy is so so there are your first two aspects one your product disclosure statement two have a look at the policy and see what is actually covered and what the ex exclusions and exemptions are and the third part is the circumstances of the incident you've got to look at witnesses you've got to look at the the actual premises itself as a scene and determine whether what they're saying could that have happened and we're looking at issues such as insurance contracts here so it's civil it's not beyond reasonable doubt so on the balance of probabilities does the circumstance or do the circumstances that the insured has given you fit within what it looks like when you go to the property so I'm guessing again, but Airbnb knew who that property was rented to. So yep. they have, they do have an actual <laughs> insurance investigation arm. I've had a claim okay. made against me for mouldy carpet in one I stayed in in, Air, in Byron Bay, which was in like a rainforest area. It was completely yep. damp. It was summertime. They tried to claim something like $12,000 for repairs to the wooden floor. Now I wasn't paying wow because it was mouldy already and had nothing to do with me. And it was in, you know, the tropical Byron Bay in a rainforest area. And I, I took them to task on it and they dropped it because it had nothing to do with me. But the owner of the property was trying to scam me in relation to getting free repairs on his floor. Now, in the case, in this case, Airbnb would have gone to the people who rented the property. And yes, they would have asked them, what was the condition of the property when you went in? Were their locks broken? Yep. Did you steal anything? 
<laughs> and they'd be going, oh no, we were there, you know, with the kids for holidays. So it was two couples. And so it's four people. Um, the kids are older kids. So they're over the age of 19. And there were three of them. So there's seven people they can go on interview and say <laughs> separately, what was the property like when you got there? What was it like when you left? Yeah. Did you take anything? No. Now that's one scenario. But I'll give you another scenario and Pat just hit it right on the head. You can insure extremely valuable stuff in your property, in your policy. So let's say the silver banana that she's spoken about, (laughs) actually a solid silver (laughs) um, piece of object to art that her late great grandmother left her in a will and it's been on Antiques Roadshow and the Antiques Roadshow person said, I would place an insurance value on this of $16,000. It's exactly what Pat said. It would may cost uh, $300 to insure that piece for $16,000, but you can get it on your home and contents policy. So there's some things here that, you know, just to running through my investigator brain, why didn't she claim it on her contents policy? Did she have one? She may not have had one. She's gone straight to Airbnb and claimed it there. And she was charged by, with fraud by the police through what would have been supplied to them by Airbnb and their investigation. The police would not have had a, a major interest in investigating this, but Airbnb did because they would have been liable had you know that been an extremely valuable set of items stolen. And, and Another again, little aspect... Another little aspect too is where you take out separate or additional cover for something that's valuable, such as jewellery, a painting, a fur coat or whatever, generally that'll be accompanied by minimum security requirements by the insurance company. They may need you to have deadlocks um, on all the doors, locks on all the windows. They may even ask you, depending on the value of what you're insuring, they may even ask you to make sure that you've got an alarm system and it might be specified the type of alarm system so the minimum security aspects that's very important on things that are an add-on to a normal house policy or a normal policy my word now again so pat i give you a list of items right and i say these have been stolen from my property a silver banana some designer label shoes and a swaskowski handbag What are you going to say to me next when you're taking a statement off me over my general insurance claim about those things? Okay. Where you've got something or you're claiming to have something that has been stolen, if it's a valuable item, and I'm guessing the the jewellery and the silver banana and things like that, are they're quite valuable. So therefore, you should be able to provide details of where you bought it from, how much you paid for it, and generally most people will keep receipts for extremely valuable items. They may even have had valuations done by jewellers or an art, an art critic or an art broker or something like that. Generally you'll, generally you'll find that. If the items are just within the normal policy, people may not have a receipt in regards to the purchase of it. They may have bought it on eBay or when they're in Bali or Thailand or wherever they bought it from. However, you can generally provide evidence that you did in fact have that by things such as photographs where the item's been worn on a social occasion or whatever like that. This day and age, it's fantastic because you have all the metadata, the file properties and everything of the um, photographs that if they produce a photograph of the um, item being worn at a, a gathering in 2019 or 2020 it will have the metadata and the file properties that relate to that photograph being taken on that time sometimes you'll get photographs that they purport to show the jewelry being worn by someone at a social gathering and if you have a look at the file properties you might find that the photograph was taken after they spoke to you when you did your interview with them and they said oh look i'll have a look around and i'll see if i can find a photograph So those photographs that they produce, always have a look at them and have a good look at them in their digital form and see whether they've got any properties that you can actually use to confirm or refute the fact that it was taken at the time they said. 
And you can find out all about that in Australian Security Academy CPP 30619 Certificate 3 Investigative Services course in Pat Fling's Digital Evidence Presentation. How yep. to actually do that. Now, Pat, I'm a little bit of a slippery character making all these claims and I go, hang on, no, the um, silver banana, that was a wedding present. I've got a receipt for it, all right, but it was worth $16,000. What are you going to say to me? Okay. If it was a wedding present worth $16,000, who gave it to you? Can I yeah, get in contact Fred, with the person? He's dead now, Uncle Fred. He's dead now. Yep. Again, you come back to the fact that if you've been given a gift that's worth some value, the person who gave it to you, if they've passed away, it will be a talking point amongst other members of the family and friends and things like that. Even the close people that were at the wedding, they'll know that was a really valuable piece of an item that was given to them by someone at the wedding. So yeah, it comes down to asking those next level questions down. He's dead. Okay. Who was there that saw this? Who was there that knew the value of what you bought? Who was with you when you bought it? Those sorts of questions. Fantastic. So from there, we can go to the other witnesses and they can confirm or give their version of events as to what they know about it. And it might not be anything or it might be something, but at least we're carrying out the investigation in relation to the claim. That's our job. Okay, so we contact those other witnesses. As soon as the person mentions who gave it to them, we ask for the name, address and contact details. If they say they're dead, well, who, like Pat said, who else knows? Does your younger sister know? Does your mother know? Does your older brother know? What's their contact details? I need to confirm it with them, please. Now, if a person's evasive about that level, this is where your questions really should be starting to yep. go deeper and your, your, your actual identification of how they came to have that item it's got to come back to a day, date and time. Yep. It can't just appear and then disappear. So yep. with that, one of the tools we use in most general insurance claims is a time and event line. So what date was your wedding? Yep. All right, it was your first wedding, not your third one, but what date was your wedding? And who were the guests and who else might know? If it's a very expensive item, if it's $15 worth of jewellery, I don't think it's that's going to be a big deal. But the date of the wedding, the guests, other people that have knowledge of that gift is going to be very important. The Swarovski handbag, I don't know how to say that. And how could we get to the uh, critical point of when that was bought or where from? How do we do that? Same thing, just questioning, where did you buy it from? You'll find that there'll be retailers that will only stock that brand. Whether it was a real Swarovski handbag or it was a an imitation or a fake that was bought in Bali you've got to go down the track with all of those questions when you do your interviews another thing to do too just while we're on that point don't immediately assume things or don't immediately have the conspiracy theory that this is a dodgy claim I recall many years ago I did a claim and it was in a quite a modest house in Miami on the Gold Coast here. It was a, just a modest three bedroom brick veneer on a slab. When I got there, um, the man who owned the house was 29 years of age. There was very little furniture in the house and the claim was for $33,000 worth of jewelry, which is a lot of jewelry. I don't have $33,000 worth of jewelry. So jewelry <laughs> of that value, my my alarm bells were ticking away in the background, but you go through the process as you would with any other claim. You ask the questions, you ask for proof, you ask for all the information in regards to it. And surprisingly, this man was a builder. He was 29 years of age. He had, he owned a house. He owned or nearly had the full price paid off of a unit. And this was an investment property that he had. And at the ripe old age of 29, he had over $650,000 of equity in his properties. And when I asked him about the jewellery and the specifics of it, he had photographs, he had valuations from jewellers. They were all proper pieces of jewellery that were 
purchased in jewellery shops here on the Gold Coast and in Australia. There was nothing that was bought overseas where he couldn't establish it. And in the end, it was a totally le legitimate claim. But initially, I thought, I don't know about this, because there was very little furniture in the house when I did the interview with him. So, yeah, you've got to be mindful of that, but you've still got to ask the questions and go through the process the same way each time. And keep an open mind about it, because as yes. an investor, you're never going to cease to be amazed. <laughs> it can actually be the way it was described too. Yeah. So equally, that's your role. You're not there just to pin it on a person. You're there to find out if it existed, when it went missing, and if it really is missing, if it happened as the circumstances described. Well, that was an abrupt end. Thanks very much, Pat, for dropping by and doing that for us. I'm sorry I haven't been in touch, mate. Been flat out morning. So, people, you are here to get your CPD points for the Academy of Investigation Risk and Loss Adjusting Professionals. You have to answer this question. So you're interviewing the witness and the witness describes something to you. So let's have a look at the witness's description. It's like the size of a banana, is what she says. So you are taking the statement. It's a general insurance statement. You cannot accept that description. The size of, the banana, of a banana is meaningless, right? You have to get further information. So if you're a member of the Academy of Investigation, Risk and Loss Adjusting Professionals and you want to score yourself three CPD points, email me your answer to what you will reply when the person says to you who you are interviewing, it was like the size of a banana. So what are you going to do next? How are you going to address that description? I mean, there's bananas like this and then there's bananas like this. They're different types of bananas. So we've got to get more information off that person. Email me your answers, members, and I'll award you your three CD PD points. That means you can retain for a further year your associate membership. You can go up to a next level membership with AirLap in relation to that. So send that through to me um, in the email and I'll look forward to um, issuing that <laughs> in the future. We've got a winner. Kelly has won herself a private investigator coffee mug. Now, Kelly has to email me or PM me her address so I can address it and post it to her. And this time next week, while she is watching Spy Curious, she'll be sipping out of her private investigator or her... Australian Security Academy Investigation Coffee Mug. Well done, Kelly. PM me that address or email it to me. And uh, great. Anyone else want to win a coffee mug? Do what Kelly just did in the comments. So we're now going to shift gear and go straight into Spy Curious because we're going to take advantage of grabbing a little bit of extra time. And guess who we're going to introduce next? <laughs> Kelly's, Kelly's very excited. <laughs> Coffee mug on the way. It's birthday person, Casey <laughs> Pine. Happy birthday, Casey. Thank you so much. What did you get? Oh, clothes and jewelry. I was very surprised. Oh, very good. You had a good day. I did. Okay. So just we're still in air lap just for the moment. And I just wanted you to go through um, just quickly. Um, the post nominal issue, that, and if you wouldn't mind, please, Casey. Yeah, absolutely. So don't forget that you can um, have a presence on your email, your LinkedIn, your uh, SIM cards, saying that you are an associate member of AIRLA, and that just helps. <laughs> Let people know that you're part of a industry association and that you work hard at your job to the extra three points. Uh, it goes a long way in helping you as an investigator. Thanks, Casey. Really appreciate that. So get the post nominal on your business card, get it on your website, 
get it on your Facebook. If you have risen up to associate member, you can have that post um, nominal uh, on, on those, those cards and those sites. So we're going to shift gear, go straight into Spy Curious, and we better do our introductory music that suits our guest for today. morning Casey. I interviewed the blind investigator. Whoa and I'm sure he would have been full of it. Let's have a look at the first part of the interview. Thank you so much for joining us and of course um, I'm really excited about the book and I would love to know more. So how is the process going? Well um, firstly thanks again for for inviting me along. Um, yeah the book's going well um, the, the publishing company, uh, Big Sky Publishing, which incidentally is based up your way in Brisbane, wow. uh, they've been closed down over Christmas, so they've just, just got back up and running. Yeah. And they're currently in the process of uh, doing a sort of a high-level review of the, of the book, of the manuscript. Um, in other words, they're just correcting my spelling mistakes and making sure everything, everything runs well. Um, when that's done, uh, they're going to go ahead and when the final proof's been uh, approved, uh, they're going to start printing. Um, but at this stage, we're looking at a, a book release date sometime in August. I think they're, they're doing it for, for, fa for Father's Day, uh, I, would, I would assume. So that's where the, the physical side of the book is. It's uh, moving along quite nicely and they appear to be happy with the progress. So... Uh, it's nothing I know anything about, so I'm happy to go with the flow on that. Yeah. They're, they're the experts. Yeah, that's brilliant. And do you know um, yet where we'll be able to buy the book? Will it be online or? Yes, um, it will be. Um, it will be online. It will be. I think just, it's distributed through Simon and Schuster, which are a very recognised uh, distribution yeah. company. And it will be um, available in most of the normal lads of bookshops. It will also be available online and I think through, at this stage, Booktopia. I am. So you can buy the audible books, which is obviously good for people like myself that can't see. Yeah. Or indeed for, for a lot of investigators and surveillance operators who spend hours sitting alone in the car, you can just put it on and listen to it while you're observing. Yeah, absolutely. That's how I read most of my books in inverted commas sitting on surveillance listening to an audio book <laughs> thank you so much well, we'll back that up again we're live <laughs> so andy's talking about his book and um we'll have a little bit more of the interviews with andy later on but as we were presenting this program this time last week a very expensive accident was occurring in Devonport, and I'm going to show you the actual live video of it happening. Now, this is claim is going to run into the millions of dollars, and effectively, there were some people there who witnessed it and filmed it. They're actually dock workers. So i um, just got a comment. <laughs> Evan said happy birthday, Casey. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. <laughs> Lots of people say happy birthday there, Casey. Lots and lots of people. So anyway, there were some people who actually witnessed the accident. Now, when you watch a lot of surveillance video like I do and you make a lot of surveillance, surveillance video like Casey does, you know it's for real when you see power lines and feet because that's what happens in real surveillance. You know it's not a setup. And here is a guy stacking a large ship into two tugboats and causing a major accident. 
So we're in the Mersey River at Devonport, and this is the Goliath cement ship ramming two tugboats. This has happened last week while we were on this program. And you can see workers there filming it because this is going to be expensive and it's just unreal that this type of thing could happen. So they're zooming in and they're zooming out and that um, Goliath cement ship is a massive great big ship and it has destroyed and sunk two tugboats and it may have done some damage to the other one so here we go we're going to zoom in a little bit closer and crunch there it goes straight into the first tugboat and concertina's the second tugboat so a loss adjuster or a private investigator is going to be sent by the insurance company that's got to pay for this accident now it'll be a single insurance company the insurer of goliath cement or cement australia as it is known today it sort of reminds you of that um tv commercial tugboat what tugboat ah, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> goliath cement now that boat sails from the mersey river after receiving dry cement from the Railton Cement Factory, about 40 k's outside of Devonport. It can carry 776,950 20 kilogram bags of cement. That's the capacity of that ship. It's 15,539 tonnes. That's why it can squash tugboats. It has a draft of 6.5 metres, which is only meaningless to nautical people like myself, and probably Casey doesn't understand that. <laughs> it's carrying a hell of a lot of cement. Now, if that Goliath cement ship then went out into Bass Strait and sank with 15,539 tonnes of cement in it, do you know what that would mean? It would mean at low tide, you could walk from Devonport to Melbourne because that's a hell of a lot of cement. So this is a very, very big accident. The boat didn't sink, all right? So the boat survived it, the tugboats were damaged, and it's gonna come down to who the insurer of the um, Goliath cement ship was, uh, who the captain was, who was on in charge on the bridge, what instructions were they given? Was there a pilot in there now? What they have with these ships is they have pilots that go onto them and they help them around the harbours and when they come in. So we don't know that, but that's all going to come into this as well. So there's a whole lot of things happening. Now, I used to do investigations at Goliath Cement, but it was Goliath Cement. And it is an incredibly rich company. You go into the cafeteria there and the waiter staff are five-star staff. They're in white shirts and black ties, and they're serving people in work boots, overalls, and high-vis gear. It's really amazing sight to see. Fabulously rich organisation, massively big ship, big accident. This, on the scale of accidents that are ever going to be investigated, <laughs> this is one of the big ones with those two tugboats. So, look, if you search tugboats on the internet, you're looking quarter of a million starting price for a 15 year old one i think there's one in monsterston about that <laughs> so so it's going to take some replacing because devonport is a major shipping port that's where the ferry goes the two ferries that go between melbourne and devonport so it's a tasmanian tourism lifeline so i'll play it one more time just so you can see it very rarely when you're the investigator you get this unless it's on cctv you know it's real. Here it goes, straight into squash. And you can see the cement silos on the right of screen in the background. That's those big tall buildings. That's where the cement's stored by the trains as it waits to be pumped onto that big ship to take it over to the mainland in Melbourne. Massively big ship. So that happened last week while we were um, here on this program. Well, we were doing this program, so we should have been <laughs> watching that instead, waiting for it to happen. But um, <laughs> I loved it. So the video of it, as you can see, the video was real. 
you see the sky, you see the boots, you see all that sort of thing. You know you've got real video, you know it isn't stage. Let's go back to see what Casey said to Andy next. Um, and will you be doing any book signing? For the launch? Well, yeah, they, uh, look, it's early, early stages, but they're uh, they're going to line up a few um, book signings. I would imagine um, it'll be in Melbourne, Sydney, and possibly Brisbane, um, but that's still got to be confirmed. But they're, they're still t they're talking about doing that. Yeah. And yeah, so at, at this stage, um, it's just been muted, but uh, but. But not um, not decided upon. But I think that that's definitely in their plans. So got to do some job vacancies. I'll just try and bring it up. I hope go. he makes it up to Brisbane. Sorry. I hope he makes it up to Brisbane. <laughs> He'll get his, get his guide dog out and start walking up to Brisbane. <laughs> hope he doesn't drive. <laughs> that would be a concern. Oh God. You heard what he said about me. <laughs> okay, people, job vacancies. Let's have a look at some of the job vacancies. So dispute resolution officer, job vacancy in Sydney. Corporate investigative services down in Melbourne are after a licensed private investigator. A senior factual crime investigator wanted by Suncorp in Brisbane. Fraud claims investigator is wanted by QBE. Factual investigators wanted by ProCare Group. You've got to be a licensed factual investigator. You better be a member of an industry association. Um, the factual invest more ProCare Group. The lot there. <laughs> Assistant Director of Fraud Investigations for the NDIS. The um, ProCare are looking for circumstance investigators in Melbourne. That's just some of the jobs. Whoops, that's just some of the jobs that are there. I'll come back to more in a minute. But um, they're just some of the job vacancies. Where do you go to find those job vacancies, people? Well, we do it all for you. All you have to do is go to the Australian Security Academy, Australian Private Investigation, Corporate and Government Investigation Facebook page, and you'll see those job vacancies listed there. We add about 30% of the available job vacancies for government investigators. You'll need a certificate for a government investigation from the Australian Security Academy. And for private investigators, you'll need a certificate three in, government, in investigative services from the Australian Security Academy for those jobs. If I'm going too fast for you and you miss all this, you can just hit replay at the end of this presentation. Or you can pop over to our YouTube channel tomorrow and replay the whole program and see that job vacancy. So they're just some of the things you can do. If you want to win a private investigator coffee mug, type in the comment section over on the right, problem solve the blind investigator and PM me your um, postal address and I will send you a private investigator coffee mug. Thanks, George. It is a great YouTube channel. I really enjoy it. Nearly up to 140,000 views on there at the moment, mate. Really appreciate it. So that's how to find where those jobs are and review them. We update it every two days. So get on there and have a look. Back to Casey and Andy. What did they talk about next? Um, and will you be doing any book signings? for the launch? Well, yeah, they, uh, look, it's early, early stages, but they're uh, they're going to line up a few um, book signings. So he's got some book signings and happening. And do you know how much a copy of the book will be, the the price of it? Well, if, if Mike was selling them, it'd be about $1,000 a copy, you know, um, and it would come in a laminated gold case or whatever. But I uh, know... Uh, it's not, it hasn't been decided, but I, I think it would be somewhere between $25 to $30. I, th I think it was discussed early on um, that they, they were thinking that would be the price. It's, um, I think it's around about eighty to 90,000 words, wow. and about 25 chapters. So there's a fair bit in it. Um, yeah. And uh, having said that, that was why we tried to, to make the chapters, each one, different and kind of versatile. Whereas you could almost write a book, and, and I'm sure most of your surveillance people that are listening in, or factual people could write a book on following people, you know, different stories, but it becomes kind of mundane. So I try to to break it up a bit to, to give the, 
but we had a, a different idea of what we do at different times. You certainly did, Andy. You broke it up quite nicely. I've oh, just got to get rid of that picture. <laughs> Dashboard today. <laughs> Let's go back to those jobs for a minute. Uh, try and go a little bit further along. So, um, yeah, so NDIS are looking for investigators, fraud investigators for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So that's a great opportunity, people. Get on our Facebook page and have a look at that. Um, there is an assistant director of fraud investigations, again, at the NDIS, between $80,000 and $110,000 per annum they're paying. Um, Inspector General of Taxation there for $80,000 to $110,000. Um, disregard the parking officer. We don't want to do that. <laughs> um, again, we're looking at NDIS quite frequently, although at m &A investigations, looking for licensed private investigators in Melbourne, you'll be doing um, general insurance investigation, which we just spoke about. Uh, fraud and corruption investigator for Victorian Power. What a great job. That would be an excellent job for anyone that snaps, snapples that. Dispute Revol resolution officer and conciliator um, is uh, wanted down at Energy and Water Ombudsman of New South Wales. So anywhere you see water or energy, that sort of thing, they have a lot of investigation um, vacancies because they get a lot of complaints in those roles. And also we have um, the YMCA, we're looking for an investigator down in, in Melbourne to be in charge of their safety. Um, so uh, where did I go? <laughs> Yeah, so the YMCA after a safety investigator, and I'm sure you could all do that, safeguarding investigator at the YMCA, jump on our Facebook page and have a look at that job and you can see how to um, apply for it down there. And did you hide any secrets in your book that only a few people will know or understand? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, look, uh, I think we, we touched on this the last time, but... I've changed the names on, on some of the stories to protect some of these people I talk about have passed away now, but um, to protect families that are still alive. There's some unsavoury stuff in it. And, um, you know, you don't want to throw mud long after the person's died, especially at the family. So, um, yeah, we've changed the names to protect some of the innocent parties that not necessarily... So... Andy answered those questions. There's been a really big other claim down in Devonport in Tasmania. Now, this one happened where Casey actually got involved in a New Year's Eve water pistol fight one night. Do you remember that, Casey? No. <laughs> you were staying there with your grandmother and all hell erupted with water pistol fights and um, buckets of water and that sort of thing. It was at Shearwater in Devonport. Now, what happened... We'll have a look at it and bring the headline up. Is there's a man at the Shearwater Bowls Club and he's a volunteer there and he's on the barbecue cooking some sausages and he's cooking these sausages away and there is a underneath the barbecue the incorrect fat catch-up where the fat from the sausages drips down. Now, it's not the actual thing that came with the barbecue. Someone's just put it in and hasn't installed the actual fat catcher. So he's cooking away and that receptacle catches on fire. Now, because there are children around him, he grabs the receptacle that's on fire with his right hand and tries to take it away from them and injures his, injures his right hand. He got paid out this Wednesday in Tasmania by three magistrates $1 million for the injury to his hand. Now, it happened a couple of years ago. It was appealed by the Bowls Club. They said, that's too much. We're not paying that much. But three magistrates stuck by it and said, yep, he deserves $1 million for that injury. 
Now, the bowls club argued that he contributed to his own injury by doing it when he shouldn't have, and it was a 15% contribution that the court actually accepted. They would have paid him more had he not picked up the burning fat and walked around with it, which added to his injury. But this brings up some really interesting things. This is a public liability investigation. Now, these are capped at $30,000 which is pretty weird, and he's been granted $1 million. So what they've done is they've said, yep, the insurance company of the Shearwater Bowls Club is going to pay $1 million. Now, got a comment? Yeah, it's a lot of money. My word, it's a lot of money. I don't think you'd trade it, though. Um, If you go to the Workers' Compensation Queensland website and you look at um, basically what they pay out for these sorts of things, they're going to tell you that the loss of one hand in workers' compensation is worth $187,000. That's the scale price. It's pretty crap. All right, so this isn't the Tasmanian one. It's just one I could find because the Tasmanian one's buried somewhere. But these compensation schedules that you see for workers' compensation, that's not a lot of money. Now, he has got it through public liability. That's He's, in, he's sued the Shearwater Bowls Club through their public liability insurance, right, which, is, which we investigate all the time as investigators, and he's been awarded a million dollars. Now, how did they come at that amount of money? Well, they, he is a tradesperson. He's a volunteer trying to help the bowls club, okay? And as a tradie, at the age he is, he will not be able to use that hand to build whatever he built, whether he was an electrician, I don't know, or a plumber, I don't know, or a carpenter, or whatever he was, I don't know. But he's lost the use of that hand for X amount of years for the rest of his working life. So they've calculated the public liability just as they would a worker's compensation. They've looked at the age of the person. They've looked at the outcomes of the person, what their earning capacity would be for the next X amount of years until they hit 65. Now, if you're a standard um, dope smoker who sits around, lays in bed and watches Oprah all day, every day, right, and that's your whole life and you get injured, you aren't going to get a million dollars because you don't have that earning capacity. (laughs) You could try it, but they'll see through that pretty quickly when they send an investigator out to interview your past employers and yourself. So here they've got a person that's a qualified tradesperson who has the earning capacity of a million dollars for the rest of his life, and he cannot use his right hand as a result of failure to maintain that barbecue at the Shearwaters Bowl Club. So interesting investigation then. Again, Shearwater, right next door to Devonport. (laughs) Oh, they would have asked some very hard questions. Very hard questions. They would have gone, why did you touch it? And he would have gone, well, there was children around, lots of children. There were three-year-olds, five-year-olds. I needed to get it away from. I don't know, but I'm only assuming that that's what he would have been saying. It was a safety. And the court actually thought that they actually acknowledged that that's what he was trying to do. So he severely injured that hand. Yeah, so he, he would be a, young, a younger person trying to do the right thing, and um, that's how they've calculated. Don't try it at home to think you're going to get a million dollars and cash in. Don't do it. He, he would not. He'd rather have his hand than the million bucks on I, well aware of that with the people I've interviewed. So, yes, large amount of money, but the circumstances of it would have been failure to provide a safe place of work because they didn't install that fat catcher in relation to it. So Devonport's hit the headlines this week. Big boat accident and at the Shearwater uh, Bowls Club, which is um, a stone's throw from Devonport, that's what's happened there as well. We spoke to some of Andy's workmates in relation to uh, his book. One of my aims in these programs as we build towards the launch of your book, Andy, is to invite people into uh, 
Spy Curious, our Friday weekly investigation news program, who yep. have met you in the past or who have worked with you. So oh, okay. <laughs> now, okay. that you're, now that you're very nervous and in the hot seat, I'm going to introduce you to some of those people. This is a little bit like Andrew Chambers, this is your life. I, I'm not sure about this. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. So here's someone I'm sure is very special to you who's got a, a lovely message for you. Hi, Andy. I just want to say congratulations on the many successful years in the industry, which has obviously given you plenty of stories to tell. You always said you wanted to write a book, so I'm very glad that you're able to pen your experiences, which can now be shared with everyone. We worked together for over 20 years in which we achieved some pretty amazing results with some fairly interesting cases along the way. I'm now keen to read about all your earlier adventures. I'm very proud. Congratulations, Andy, and all the very best always. Take care. Lovely, Mike. Lovely. Tanya Bateman. Well, that was Tanya. That was lovely words. Very kind. Um, and it proves that um, although sometimes it pays to be nondescript in this industry when you're following people and whatnot, she was a beautiful woman who carried her job off perfectly, uh, hardworking. And I even remember a time when she was heavily pregnant with her first child and uh, I sent her out to do surveillance and it ended up with the target actually helping her up a flight of stairs. So um, just shows you what can be achieved in this industry. <laughs> That's, that's one of um, Tanya's great stories that she tells our students yeah. in our classes in Melbourne. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, look, uh, she was an expert in uh, personal protection and um, organising events uh, from a security perspective. Some of the largest companies in Australia, their AGMs were run smoothly because of, of because of Tanya's efforts. Um, she was uh, a bodyguard uh, and uh, I'd say an assassin. But I'm a person of character. <laughs> so you had to be careful if you cross swords with her. That was for sure. <laughs> My word. And thanks for that, Tanya. That was really great. Yeah, thanks for that, Tanya. That was absolutely wonderful to um, give that kind of support to Andy and his book that he's writing. It was great to see. Um, he, he was absolutely chuffed. Uh, yeah. And another person you've worked with quite a bit um, sent this. Okay, got Angelo ready to go? Uh, yep. Okay. And Andy, we um, have another former work colleague that's uh, wishing you well as well. Casey, if you'd like to play that for us. Okay. Good Andy. Congratulations on the book. And I'm sure it's going to be a great read given the decades of experiences that you have in the investigations field. I'm looking forward to it. Um, maybe I don't even have to read it given that we spent so much time working together, what, probably over 25 years. But uh, look, I'm buy, I'll buy a copy. And I'll make sure everyone I know buys a copy too to support you. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to make it in the book, but is it true that you actually met Alan Pinkerton? Uh, that'd be a pretty good story to hear about as well. Congratulations again, mate, and uh, good luck. Brilliant. Angelo Chris Manic. Fantastic. So you met Alan Pinkerton, Andy? Yeah, we were drinking buddies um, <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> At uh, the we, end of the Civil War? Uh, no, the start of the Civil oh, War. Oh, the start of the Civil War. In America. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, <laughs> that's Angelo's personal joke with me because I was a fair bit older than Angelo. Um, he used to say, you must have known Alan Pinkerton, who died in 1874, I think. So. Um, yeah, very funny. But... Oh, boy. And so Angelo used to work with Andy, and for 20 years, as Angelo said there, sorry about my editing, is a little bit off today. I was under time pressure to, to get that right. Casey did such a big effort to get that out there today. And... We've got one more, but this is one that I've really buggered up. So I'll just play the actual um, video because it's from a person in the industry to support Andy and his book. And this person used to work with Andy, but I'll play the full one next week. But 
here's, here's the part that uh, I've still got. G'day Andy, Paul Yorg from Sure Fact, mate. I hope you're well. You've written a book called Problem Solved, The Blind Investigator. Mate, that's awesome. Can't wait to read it. I know the rest of the Sure Fact team are pretty keen to read it as well, mate. So uh, those years of experience that uh, you've dedicated to the industry will be sensational uh, to pass on. Thanks, mate. Looking forward to it. And uh, Paul, Andy, was really pleased to have your support as well, mate, and told some great stories. And I'll play it in full next week once I've got time to get my editing right. <laughs> been, been a big, big morning. So uh, let's see, covered all those, covered all of those. Uh, Quantum Corp in the Northern Territory are looking for licensed private investigators people. Um, get in touch with them uh, and replay this video on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, MJM are looking for general insurance investigators. Now, you saw general insurance previously at 1.30 per day in our um, AirLap presentation. Don't forget to send me your answers for that so you get your three CPD points. Uh, that's really, really important. I found those tugboats. Use the second-hand tugboats. So most of them are price on application. <laughs> oh, boy, is that going to be an expensive claim. For those of you that missed our tugboats, oh, so I can't resist. I've just got to do it one more time. Here it goes. The Goliath cement ship, it transports cement, ran straight into two tugboats and squashes them. It must have been amazing to witness. <laughs> it would have been absolutely sensational to witness that. If you want to get a feel of what that's like, while you're waiting for your sausage schedule of Bunnings this week, buy a 20 kilo bag of cement, right? And in Queensland, wait in line in the heat, <coughs> holding it while you're waiting to get served for your sausage sizzle, and it'll give you an idea of just how heavy that's war. That, why there's still a wharf there, I don't know. So uh, it's going to be interesting, this, this investigation of that accident. It's going to go on for two and a half years. Yeah. That simple little 10-second um, video that you just saw there, the investigation is just going to go on and on and on for such a long time because this insurance company won't want to pay for it and that insurance company won't want to pay for it and they'll be arguing about who's liable and um, whatever. And if there was a pilot involved, that insurance company of the pilot service will be uh, joined into it. It's not just going to be cut and dried. So, people, we've had our um, February airlap meeting today. Send me your answers to our banana question, please, AirLap members, for your CPD points. We've had our Spy Curious meeting today all rolled into one. We're working on separating them and uh, our op options in relation to that. But the important thing is I had two industry associations this week cancel meetings and all of 2022 in January and February the Academy of Investigation, Risk and Loss Adjusting Professionals has put on its meetings and you were part of it today. Thanks for coming in, Casey. Really appreciate you giving up your time and interview your <laughs> marathon interview with Andy this morning and saving it from um, disaster with our connections and getting it going properly. It was a valiant effort. Really appreciate it. That's okay. Uh, Andy, worth it. <laughs> especially on the day after your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, we've got a comment. I lost it. <laughs> There's a few laughs at that one. <laughs> Good day, Chris. Mate, your certificate will be there early next week. Sorry about that. It's been a busy week. I know you're waiting on it. Um, we're going to go out in our usual way which we end every Friday with as a tradition. We have for 129 episodes. We don't see any reason for today being different. Tell us about 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 Tell us this week complete, people. We'll look forward to seeing you next week at 2 p.m. Queensland time 
or 3 p.m. New South Wales, Victorian, Tasmanian time for Spy Curious, which will only run for half an hour next week. Thanks, thanks, Evan. <laughs> really appreciate it. Though. <laughs> this is Casey Pine and Mike Evans. We'll see you next week. See you, everyone.